Now, if we move on to the topic of uh, total knee instability, uh, this is a patient uh, who uh, presented underwent a total knee revision with a posterior stabilized mobile bearing prosthesis and now presents with recurrent knee dislocation. Um, so the, 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 the question, the answers are listed here. Um, and if you look at the radiograph, you can see here there's a posterior dislocation of the knee. And <clears throat> The more, most likely explanation for this, and you can see that 100% of the respondents got this correct, is that in fact the, the flexion gap is too loose. So in the revision of the prosthesis, there was increased laxity in flexion, which ultimately uh, resulted in a dislocation uh, of this posterior stabilized knee. Um, instability is a problem. And it's one of the uh, main causes of revision knee surgery. Uh, studies have demonstrated up to 10 to 20 percent of knee revisions are performed for knee instability. And when you talk about instability, there are certainly different planes or combination of planes that you need to be aware of. So you can have coronal plane instability in the varus or valgus plane or as shown in this case, anterior posterior flexion instability, or the most severe type of instability is, is global, where one has instability both in flexion and extension. Now, <clears throat> if one looks at the coronal instabilities, uh, varus and valgus, uh, there are different causes that can, that can produce this. And certainly uh, the most uh, problematic is in the operating room where there is a transection with the oscillating saw during the actual uh, procedure itself with loss of uh, stability secondary to a uh, laceration of the uh, medial, uh, medial ligament. Uh, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that if you are too zealous with your retraction, particularly in the flexion space, um, and you, particularly in an older patient with poor both bone and soft tissue, you can over distract medially or laterally and basically lose the stability of your ligament structures on the medial most commonly or lateral side of the joint. So when you put laminar spreaders or whatever you use to distract that uh, flexion space, uh, be careful in that population not to be too vigorous in doing that. Uh, additional causes of coronal instability, a failure to correct uh, both, deform both the uh, preoperative deformity with asymmetrical soft tissue balancing in the medial and lateral plane, or uh, an incorrect bone cut with uh, malalignment and that can also produce asymmetry of the soft tissues and ligaments across the joint with resultant coronal instability. Now, um, the treatment for uh, coronal instability, if it, uh, in the intraoperative treatment, is certainly, as I mentioned, to significantly pay attention to the proper balancing of the medial and lateral side of the joint. So there is symmetry of the soft tissue envelope and so the implant will then block open the gaps in flexion extension in a symmetrical fashion. If there is injury, a transection uh, of the medial collateral ligament, then the best treatment is to immediately suture it, uh, the crack eye, su crack eye suture, suture anchor, use what you like, but to stabilize the ligament immediately. And then generally, um, it mentions here the use of either a a CR or PS implant, I would recommend the use of a, at least a PS, posterior stabilized implant, or a CCK, constrained condylar implant, just to back up that repair and try to take some tension off the repair by providing an implant that has more intrinsic stability. Additionally, postoperatively, a brace should be used. Uh, 
for six weeks while that ligament uh, heals. Here's a paper that um, uh, has been uh, looked at, which and, 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 and is, is a nice review article about uh, damage to the medial collateral ligament at surgery, and talks about basically the results uh, with the management of uh, injuries to the medial collateral ligament in, intraoperatively by doing the medial repair and then backing it up with a brace with satisfactory results. If there is damage to both the medial as well as lateral collateral ligament, then you have a more significant problem with very poor stability. And as a rule, you would revise that to a hinge device and not rely on a damaged medial and collateral ligament or at least a uh, constrained implant. So the next question deals um, again with uh, instability of the knee. Um, a diagram is shown, which we'll look at together in a moment. And you can see here that uh, total, knee, uh, total knee arthroplasty has been performed. Um, <clears throat> there is intraoperative examin examination reveals coronal instability. And what are the best next steps? So we've reviewed this uh, in our previous discussion. But certainly of the options provided, and this demonstrates uh, the injury that occurs to the medial collateral ligament and different iterations of implant types uh, and a selection for, for you to pick as the best uh, after you've repaired the medial collateral ligament. So uh, B here is a um, posterior, uh, is a cruciate retaining knee, uh, C is a hinge device, and D is a posterior stable device. So in that setting, uh, the best way to go, as we mentioned earlier, is to suture the ligament immediately, in, intraoperatively, and then use the hinge device uh, postoperatively. And as I mentioned earlier, I would use uh, an implant that has some intrinsic constraint built into it to back up your repair. <clears throat> now, when we talk about flexion and stability, um, what we're referring to is a mismatch, basically, between your flexion and your extension gaps. <clears throat> and this can be caused by many different, particularly intraoperative uh, problems and errors. And if one takes too much posterior femoral condylar bone as part of uh, the preparation of the femur, this will leave uh, your posterior gap extensive or greater. And that's best handled uh, by using posterior augments and translating your implant more posteriorly to fill that posterior gap and stabilize that knee inflection. If you undersize the femoral component, again, that will lead to laxity in the flexion space and will lead to flexion instability. So correct sizing of the femoral component uh, so the flexion space uh, is correct and stable is important during the procedure. Additionally, if you uh, take too much posterior slope, it should aim for about my hands about five degrees. If you're excessive with the posterior inclination, you, you can again can cr create some instability uh, in the flexion uh, space. Um, now, excessive distal femoral cuts, in my experience, lead more to extension instability than flexion instability, in that the uh, flexion gap is not influenced by the distal femoral cut. So I do not um, feel that uh, th this particular uh, re resection of the distal femur will not lead really to flexion instability, but more extension instability. And that can be dealt with with augmentation on a distal femur. <clears throat> Additionally, um, the posterior cruciate ligament um, is important if a posterior cruciate ligament retaining prosthesis is used. And it's important uh, that the quality of that posterior cruciate ligament be good uh, in order uh, to maintain flexion stability. If it is not good, and it is incompetent, uh, then you will get flexion instability. And that can be dealt with, as a rule, by converting 
your uh, CR knee into a posterior stabilized uh, configuration. <clears throat> now, um, this is another case. <clears throat> Again, looking at instability, the 66-year-old female patient who presented with instability uh, going up and down stairs after a posterior cruciate retaining total knee arthroplasty, recurrent effusions. The radiographs are here. And you can see, again, an example of posterior uh, instability uh, in this patient. And when you look at your options, again, with a PCR knee, you can see the problem here is, as we've just discussed, a posterior cruciate retaining knee, which has got posterior cruciate insufficiency. So the stability, again, to emphasize, if you use a PCR knee, the posterior cruciate ligament is important in providing flexion stability. Uh, if it is lax or is not functional, um, then you may see PCR, you may see posterior, you may see flexion instability with that device. Now, global instability is really the worst uh, example of instability in a knee as a complication. This is where you have laxity both in flexion and extension, poor soft tissue envelope, um, and global instability. And in these patients, almost always you will be required because there is very little ligament support medially or laterally in laxity in the AP direction. You're probably going to need a hinge device in that setting. <clears throat> now, here's another case, um, and this is a patient who undergoes a total knee arthroplasty with a posterior stabilized design, and then two years later returns with recurrent effusions, a feeling of instability in the knee and giving way, trouble on stairs, and examination uh, reveals tenderness around the medial side of the knee. And on examination, there is increased laxity and translation at 90 degrees of flexion in the anterior posterior uh, direction. The implant is well fixed, it's a five degree slope. And the, the question being asked here is where is the problem intraoperatively that may have created uh, this problem in the PS knee? And of the cuts that are documented here, what is the uh, cut which is leading to flexion instability in this patient? And again, the cut that will most influence the flexion space in a PS knee, uh, in any knee, is really the posterior condylar cut. So the correct answer here is that posterior condylar resection uh, here, which if excessive, even in a posterior stabilized knee, will produce uh, posterior, anteroposterior posterior instability. Remember that the PS knee provides little, if any, stability uh, and is more designed to improve the kinematics of the knee with a cam effect rather than provide stability in the knee. So the correct uh, answer here is two. Uh, again, over-resection of the posterior femoral condyles uh, in the PS knee, which led to flexion instability in this case. Now, again, one of the problems on occasion we see if the flexion gap is increased in a PS knee is that the knee can jump. Um, the bar of the femoral component can actually uh, jump over uh, the uh, polyethylene uh, Ill elevation in the polyethylene in the intercondylar area and produce dislocation. And, you know, many things can do that, particularly, again, as we talked earlier, an undersized femoral component with increased laxity in the flexion space. If you've moved your, an your femoral component to anterior, again, you're taking more bone posteriorly, and that's going to give you flexion instability and potentially a, a dislocation in the PS knee. I've never found the, the popliteus to be a particularly good stabilizer in flexion but it does provide some uh, stability and flexion. 
it is transected in bad valgus neon uncommonly, and I don't think it's a major factor in flexion stability, but it does does play a role. As we talked about earlier, uh, excessive uh, tibial slope and overcorrection or resection of bone in either valgus or varus deformity can produce uh, increased flexion instability. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.